What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Baer, and we're doing this in person this time with Tori McElhaney and Ashton Edmonds. What's up, y'all? What's Hello. up? Ooh. Yeah, man, we are coming to you after a 20-19 to victory over the, the Falcons, 20-19 victory over the Arizona Cardinals here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, where they have been playing a lot better than they play on the road. It took a fourth-quarter Comeback drive from Desmond Ritter. We're going to get into that. And Young Way Koo sealed the deal with a 21-yard field goal or something yep. like that as time expired. Um, the Cardinals had no opportunity to uh, go down and do that. It was a good ending to a game that was – we don't have to sugarcoat it, right? That was essentially meaningless between two teams mm-hmm. eliminated from playoff contention. Um, but there's still plenty to observe – and to take note of and to dissect and decipher as we move forward throughout the rest of the season and obviously into the offseason. Uh, I talk so much about this, about an offseason priority list that we're going to compile. Um, and every piece of evidence that we get um, makes brings that into clearer view. So anyway, we're going to get into all that fun stuff. I'm taking a look at Tori McElhaney. She writes the topic lists here. Um, and we're going to get into Desmond Ritter, Tyler Algier, Cordero Patterson, Young Foundation, all that fun stuff. Uh, but the the first topic that I'm I'm just gonna skip the general takeaways because I just think it's so well written here. Oh. <laughs> all caps. They won. Period. Wow. Period. Four game losing streak snapped and thoughts. Yeah. So <laughs> I like that. I like how you yeah. talked about thoughts. So um, I guess I'll just borrow from my good friend Tori here. Mm. Thoughts? Yeah. Thoughts? Question mark. Um, so just for me personally, it was interesting because I thought that this game played out exactly how the last few games have played out for the Falcons, but instead they won this game. Like they just found a way to win, which is something that they haven't been able to do in the last probably month and a half, give or take one game. Yeah. And I mean, you're still looking at this team, and at this point in the season, you know exactly who this team is. Even as you're kind of finding more about finding more out about Desmond Ritter and his progression, you know exactly what this team is. You know that this defense is going to give up some yards, but they're going to hunker down inside the 20. I use hunker down because the dogs are moving <laughs> on to the national championship. Congratulations Thank there. you. Thank you. It was wild. Uh, but we're not talking about that game. We're talking about this one. Uh, so for me, it's like, you know what that, you know what the defense is. They have now not given up more than 20 points in the last four games or 21 points in the last four games. Yep. That's, that's big for this defense. That's pieced together with a lot, a, a lot of different guys and duct tape and duct tape. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And, and then for this offense, it's about pro- seeing progress with Desmond Ritter and you still rely on the run game, which was evident with what. Tyler Algier was able to do. And then you've seen Desmond Ritter's growth. And I know we're going to get into that more, but to see his passer rating increase, to see his completion percentage increase, to see him be more comfortable in the pocket, I I felt was very, very evident. So this team is exactly what it's been the last few weeks. The Cardinals just aren't very good. They're in a very similar situation. They're, they're playing a quarterback that, it's what their fourth quarterback in yeah. this yeah. season. Yeah. That's crazy. And then, I mean, they just found a way to win. Yeah. And that's kind of my general thought. Yeah, they, they found a way to win when they haven't been able to do that right. recently. I mean, the, they went played three games in a row. Three games in a row? Mm. Yeah. They, 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 they played two games in a row where they lost by three. And then we all know what happened in, in, in Washington. But nonetheless, they snapped this four-game losing streak, and I'll ask – Ashton, thoughts? <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, um, I, I thought it was a great game. Um, I, I thought the defense played really well. I think they had what four or five red zone uh, stops, mm-hmm. um, which was which was big, like Tori said. Um, and I, I just thought they all just played. Um, they were all consistent, and you could tell that you know they wanted to win this game. Uh, they want you know when I talked to players after the game. They talked about the need to just finish strong, finish out these last two games strong, and and you could tell that they put their their best foot forward against the Cardinals, regardless um, if they're eliminated from playoff contention or not. I mean, Arthur Smith also talked about you know just the need to finish this season out strong, and um, we saw the Falcons uh, play efficient on both sides, and 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 that's why they came out with the dub. Yeah, I mean it's interesting after the Ravens lost, 
that win combined with other positives for other NFC South teams eliminated the Falcons from the playoffs. He was asked what, like, what are you looking for uh, out of the last two? And he said, victories and progress. Mm -hmm. I think we saw a little bit of both if if we're using his guidelines and why not? Because he's the one making decisions about uh, he and Terry Fontenot about what happens next. And let's be honest. This was a game against two teams with nothing to lose. <laughs> right. It had its moments where you're watching it and you're just like, gosh, the, these teams are, are a ways away from being what they ultimately want to be. So 100%. let's go ahead and put that out there, too. We're not saying that this was a fantastic win by the Falcons by any no. means. This was a, a win. Right. <laughs> yeah. It was a win. It was a win, period. <laughs> yeah. And the thing that I liked most about it is – what happened at the end? I, Arizona's defense, right, not necessarily top caliber. Still but, got J.J. Watt, though. Right, but when it mattered most, when they were down with five minutes to go, Desmond Ritter led them 67 yards. They, they got a big run from Cordero Patterson. It was mm-hmm. nice to see him be doing some things. Doing yep. some things. Yeah. Desmond Ritter, though, three for three mm-hmm. on a third and seven where you absolutely have to have it. Yeah. Otherwise, you just kick the field goal, and then the Cardinals have a chance to come back. Have to have it. He throws an absolute – rocket to Michael Pruitt, who led the team in receiving yards. Yeah. Fascinating wow. subplot. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, I think, and we're going to talk a lot about in ways that Desmond Ritter is improving, mm-hmm. right? I think you can look at all these small things and you can dissect the operation. At some point, you just kind of go in the game, right? Yeah. At some point, all those small things that we can talk about and you see signs of progress, at some point, I don't care about that. I care about how would you do when the game was on the line. Mm-hmm. And we know Desmond is a gamer. Like that, His reputation precedes him. You're not 44 and 6 in college if you haven't done some good right. things in, in the fourth quarter. The guy's a gamer. The guy gets it. Heck, he threw a, a perfect pass to – Drake London in New Orleans that could have set them up to at least tie the game. Mm-hmm. He didn't drop the ball. No, yeah. But I I think it was encouraging to see him go out there with the game on the line and find a way to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too the part of that goes along with this and this was something Scott and I were talking about after the game is like the more Desmond Ritter gets comfortable in this offense and in in the league, let's just be honest, he hasn't played but two games prior to this. So there is a – there are growing pains that you, you go through, and there is an adjustment to, one, catching up to the speed of the game, understanding that this is different than college. This is his first time playing in the league. And because of going through those growing pains and really just taking those reps that he didn't have before this, it allows you to kind of get into that gamer mode. You know, like it, 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 when you are doing the foundational fundamental things and you can kind of get those going a little bit, it allows you to be a gamer like how we saw and to go three for three in a drive that really, really mattered to to this game. And, and not just that. And something else we were talking about, too, was that those three going three for three in that drive, even though like people be, like, oh, he only threw it three times. But when you really break it down, especially in the scope of Arthur Smith's offense, that's really all he's asking his quarterbacks to do. Right. He's not asking them to go out and throw the ball seven, eight times in a drive. The the run game has its strengths, and you should be able to lean on that. And and I think that that's something that that drive encompassed, I think, what, one, this offense can look like, and two – how Desmond Ritter operates in it. And I go back to what I said earlier where it does, I think it is very evident that Desmond Ritter is comfortable, more comfortable, almost night and day comfortable than what he was the first time that we saw him in New Orleans. And this is only a very small sample size. And we have seen growth, and we have seen him take steps in the right direction. And I, I do think that that should be something that, we're talking about because it's going to matter in 2023. Right. Regardless of what the Falcons do, what they decide to do with Desmond Ritter is going to matter. And it's going to come, it's going to stem from the foundation that he sets right now. Yeah, Yeah. no, I I definitely agree with that. And I think um, the poise that we saw from Desmond Ritter in that late fourth quarter drive, 
just like you said, it's going to mean the most in the future and, and, and for this team in the future. Um, but he does continue to progress every game um, statistically. You know, he went, he completed a 73% of his passes today, and he still didn't throw any interceptions, which is amazing uh, for a rookie quarterback. Um, and he just continues to grow. Um, you know, he exudes so much confidence uh, on the field and in press conferences, and, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, that definitely provides a lot of hope for the Falcons' offense uh, moving forward in the future. Yeah, he didn't single-handedly make this an explosive passing uh, no, attack. No, no. Right. And he was no. never right. supposed to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, but I, I think as you continue to evaluate him, I think there's a lot to like. And when it comes down to it, uh, the thing, that, uh, the poise, the, mm -hmm. the moxie, the confidence that he projects, I, I asked him about that, that, that – uh, about projecting confidence, the understanding he does all these little things to let everyone know that he that that he supports them, that he's confident that that they're going to win. I asked Dave Ragone this a couple weeks ago, and Arthur last week as well. I hate when people say I asked, so I'm <laughs> sorry, I just broke my own rule. Those guys were asked by somebody, <laughs> maybe Ooh. named Scott Bear. Ma I don't know, maybe maybe not. Uh, but just about. Is he self-aware? Is he critical in meeting rooms? Mm. Can he say, oh, yep, I made a mistake right there, or is he blind to it? Mm. And both guys who work with the quarterbacks a lot say he can identify problems, and his ego isn't too big to be like, yeah, I screwed that up. Here's how I can do that better. Sometimes you have guys with supreme confidence mm -hmm. who like can't see their own shadow. Right. I don't think that's the case here, and that's another one of those encouraging signs. Look, he's got the arm talent. Mm -hmm. That's we saw what, it on that third and seven completion. Yep. Right. I mean, he's not always totally perfectly accurate, but I think that I th and he, he even talked in the – I'm getting off on a tangent now. <laughs> uh, he even talked in the press conference about early on he let the pressure affect his footwork. Mm -hmm. Who says that in a press conference? Yeah. And that's why he was inaccurate, which means he understands the process yeah. of it. And I think those are the things that I like. Yeah, it's funny too because I, I talked about this – on a couple of different occasions, I can't remember if it was podcast or written or TV or what, but yeah, you're everywhere. And I'm <laughs> doing a lot of things. Media. Um, but I remember saying in that first, in, when we were in new Orleans and we were watching Desmond Ritter operate in the pocket, he had happy feet. And yeah. I, I, I could feel it was almost, you felt that jitter. And I think that's normal for a guy in that situation. I didn't see happy feet in this game. And I think that, alone is a sign of progress. And he, I mean, he even started the game. Arthur Smith talked about like starting the game aggressively and, yeah. and he completed 12 of his first 14 passes. Right. That, I mean, that's pretty good for a guy, I think in Desmond Ritter's position right now. Yeah. And, and we're, we're going to hop back in and talk about Tyler and CP in just a second. I just want to clear something up for Falcons final whistle listeners. I read the YouTube comments. <laughs> Not always a great idea, but I did, and all three of us were getting killed in the comments because I think maybe it was misconstrued or we didn't exp – I thought we explained it well enough. But nonetheless, everybody was saying because you're considering – other quarterbacks of the future drafted or free agent or veteran or otherwise, you've already given up on Desmond Ritter as the starter. And that is not that accurate. That is not yeah. correct. And that's yeah. not what we That's said. not what we were trying to say. Yeah. I, I, I want to make it clear that we were talking about – I mean, you only have Desmond Ritter moving forward. Right. Logan Woodside was brought in just to right. be out there in case uh -huh. – the. Uh, the only person who you can feel like is going to be there next year is Desmond Ritter. Yep. You can't go into a 2023 season with just Desmond Ritter in the quarterback room. And why not get a talented right. guy? Right, yeah, yeah, you want Desmond Ritter to be pushed. Desmond Ritter is the type of guy who wants to be pushed. Like, I, I think that was all we were trying to say is that regardless of what Desmond Ritter does or doesn't do, you have to go fill the quarterback room. Yep. You, you absolutely do, and you – you Desmond, are very <laughs> contemplative. The Ritter ruckus, right, <laughs> yes. is going to be frustrated during the spring when Arthur and Terry are at Ohio State's Pro Day yeah. and at Alabama's Pro Day. And they're, and they're checking out Young and Stroud and Levis and mm -hmm. all, Ritt, all the peeps and all those guys because that's what they have to do. And I keep going back to say it, and then the tangent will be over. But I feel like if you're out on the road – 
and you find a guy who you think is a generational, perfect for my offense, fall in love with this individual, you take him no matter what the situation is. Mm. You and that's not anything that's not anything negative about Ritter. That's just a fact of the matter, is that if you feel like you have a somebody might put on a gold jacket one day type of talent in front of you and you're sitting there at whatever draft pick that you like that you have. Mm-hmm. I don't care if Matt Ryan's still on the roster. Yeah. I'm I'm probably taking a hard look at that. Yeah. Until you have that true frame I wouldn't have looked at it in Matt Ryan's third year. Right. But I look at it in twelve or thirteen. Yeah. And that's all that I think that we were trying yeah. to say. But yeah, just numbers, gotta add a quarterback, right? So yeah. might, might as well make it a good one. Right. Um might as well have someone to push right. Desmond Ritter and Desmond Ritter to push someone else. I For mean sure. I, I know it's so stupid cliche and I hate that I'm about to say this. It hurts. Do it me. anyway. The whole iron sharpening iron thing is true. Yeah. I think Arthur Smith even used the example of Drew Dahlman and Matt Hennessy today. We saw Matt Hennessy get the start at left guard. Yeah. Matt Hennessy and Drew Dahlman had the most significant position battle that I've seen since since I started covering this team. And I think Matt Hennessy is going to be better for it. I don't know what's going to happen in the offseason with that left guard position, but I do think that Matt Hennessy – could potentially be a guy who either one steps into that role or fights for that role. Yeah. And I think that's all you're asking these players to do is to compete with one another. Because at this point with this team, no position is safe. Unless you are maybe Chris Lundstrom, AJ Terrell, Grady Jarrett, Jake Matthews. Drake London. Drake London. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those guys, okay, sure, whatever. You have the money to prove that mm. you're out there for a reason. Everybody else, how much how much turnover are we going to see? A lot. Exactly. Exactly my point. So, And then after in years after that, I think we will see less and less because mm-hmm. they can spend on these uh, bigger deals. Yeah. Um, we one, need to move on. Right. <laughs> one area how, – how's this for a transition? One area where where the the need is very low – Oh, yeah. Is at running back. Yep. Mm-hmm. Because, Add them to the list, too. Right. Because Tyler Algier, that dude, the second half of the season, he looks so comfortable. He yep. looks like his BYU highlights against Nevada Reno. Yeah. You know, I mean, he <laughs> looks like he's, he, is, he gets it. He's confident. He's patient. He's all these things. And then today we have Cordero, who maybe hasn't had the best statistical season. Mm-hmm. His receiving yards are way, way down. I guess his rushing yards are way up. But we saw him used – in a way that I think everybody expected him to yes. be used because Tyler can be that three down type of running back. Mm-hmm. So you can put Cordero in the slot. He had what, six catches mm-hmm. today. Yep. He was all over the place. And I think that the combination of those two guys is super encouraging. I, spe- I mean, Tyler's averaging what, five yards a carry mm-hmm. now? Um, that, that was really encouraging. Um, Ashton and, and Arthur Smith and Desmond Ritter talked about that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, Algier, he moved into the record books today. He eclipsed over 1,000 uh, yards uh, in scrimmage. So, you know, I think that says a lot about Algier. He didn't play the first game um, against the Saints. And he was a healthy scratch. He was, Yeah, he was a healthy scratch. And, Wild. like, he came alive in the second half of the season um, and emerged as a, as a, a young quality running back. But um, what Arthur Smith said after the game is that, you know, CP is such a versatile player and you can use them together. Uh, there are a lot of plays where you see CP as a wideout, which you saw against the Cardinals today, um, and you saw the one down in the red zone, some other plays, and it's nice when you can mi- mix and match. And, you know, I-, I think that's very true, and I think that provides a lot of hope for the Falcons' offense in the future because CP is such a, an amazing and, and versatile player. Like, he's great in the backfield. He's great at wideout. And then Salah Algier, he's just a force in the backfield. Like, nobody can really tackle Algier. Um, and we saw CP, he had 42 yards receiving, 42 yards rushing, and a touchdown. Um, and, and I think that just, you know, again, that, that provides a lot of hope for the Falcons offense moving forward in the future. And um, I just think that's, that's going to make this offense uh, versatile in every way. Here's the thing that I think people need to think about when it comes to this idea of what we saw today with Tyler Algier and Cordero Patterson was that, they didn't. I don't think they necessarily even knew what they had in Tyler Algier until you get to the midpoint of the season when both CP and Damien Williams are on IR. And I think back to kind of something that Arthur Smith has talked about recently where he was talking about how CP was your featured back. And he so had to be. He had yep. because he had to be. So you use him as a traditional running back. And CP goes out and has a 200 
some odd rushing guard game in Seattle. But as Tyler Algier has emerged, you see the like mystery of CP and the, I, I hate saying this word cause I know CP doesn't like it, but the gadgety type of guy of being able to have di- a versatile, like look about what CP can provide your offense and the different packages. Definitely like two back packages yep. like that. That is something that, Tyler Algiers emergence provides this offense and that's something that Arthur Smith talked a lot about and I think it's because they have started to trust Tyler Algier and he's really proven himself that he can go out and get those dirty yards that is so I, I think that that just goes to show kind of what the trajectory of the, again, the, the emergence of Tyler Algiers' role in this offense is and how it can help Cordero Patterson because I know we have talked so many times this year. It's like, why isn't CP getting out wide like he was last year? I think that – I mean, he this was a guy who had a lot of receiving yards last year, and you're kind of wondering why. Well, that's why. He had to be the feature back for a while. Now it's kind of morphing into Tyler Algier because he's been productive, and it allows you to move CP out and do different things with him. Yeah, and that was always the plan. It was just a matter of – it wasn't – you couldn't execute it because Damian Williams got hurt in a flash. Mm-hmm. And – it just never, and and then Cordero get, gets, hurt, gets hurt, and mm-hmm. then Tyler emerges. You know, it takes. So anyway, th- this was all the plan, and that's why it's like I think it's easy to be like, well, you know, Arthur Smith is an idiot because he's not using CP the way he did last year. Well, I'm sure he really wanted to, right? And th- that's what we saw here, and mm-hmm. he uh, he identified some matchups that worked well for Patterson on like on the outside. Yeah. So it's not just a matter of oh well he's not calling this play. It's like you have, you have to think about these things. Football's so interesting to talk about, right? Because there are so many, like, dimensions. You, and if, if you're not seeing the full picture, then you're not doing it. Yeah. You know, and know, nothing that we're talking about here is not something that Arthur Smith hasn't already talked about three times over in press conferences. Yeah, that's true. He's the one that brought up all that stuff about, you know, CP goes on IR and then Tyler emerges and then you got to – and then CP's working back to full health. And he's the one that brought up that up, what, a month ago? Right. Yeah, he even said that Tyler – has, he even he's basically said that Tyler um, impressed him like as far as like how fast he adjusted to the NFL like mm-hmm. earlier uh, in the season. Just paraphrasing what he said, but um, I think the biggest thing that I like about Tyler is just like his awareness. Um, even Arthur Smith said after the game, like when it was third and two with a minute and three seconds left, you know Tyler needed three or two. He really needed two yards to get the first down, but he he got three and he went down. And that's what ran basically ran the clock out and, and helped seal the Falcons' victory. And um, I just think he's playing very maturely, and I think he's he's definitely adjusting to the game very quickly. It's it's weird. I, I think at times Arthur Smith can be – he's really good in press conferences in that if he doesn't want to answer your question, like he's, he's just not going to answer it. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes he may have a reputation of coming off as kind of like – flippant sometimes which i don't think he is right but if you listen close enough he's going to tell you the truth Mm -hmm. right you just have to be like aware of it and you have to really understand kind of what exactly what he's saying and how he's saying it i think over a couple years i feel like i'm fluent in arthur smith at least (laughs) i'm getting better at it nonetheless but uh, nonetheless he I, i think he's he's a very smart engaging individual and i do think that to your point, Tori, that there are some nuggets in there. Um, you just got to pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we kind of move forward, we've been talking about Desmond Ritter, Tyler Algier, right? And you look at how many members of this draft class and this rookie class are seeing significant time, mm-hmm. Troy Anderson and Arnold Ebikadi and so on and so forth. You're, and it's not because they're in evaluation mode. It's because those rookies have earned the roles that they've gotten. Mm-hmm. They're not just taking a look at Troy Anderson. Troy Anderson is playing better than Michael Walker right now. Mm-hmm. So when you have these young guys, and at the end of the year, they've earned it merit-based promotions, and you see them produce, if you're trying to look at this thing beyond you know, the last two games where they're not going to make the playoffs – is that this young foundation is expanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't you think? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I know. I was like, yes. Uh-huh. No, something I wrote about post-game was just this idea that I do think what we're seeing from this young foundation is that there is a foundation to build upon. The Falcons are going to have 
significant money this offseason. They're going to be able to make moves that we haven't seen them be able to make in a couple years, if not longer than that. So even in that, I feel like there are pieces in place that you can build around. And, And I say that kind of just really looking at this 2022 draft class and the way that I think that they have emerged in their own individual roles is something that, yes, gives me hope for what the Falcons can do in 2023 and 2024 and beyond. I don't think that just because they are out of playoff contention that we can sit here and be like, oh, this is it. Like, fire everyone. Like, this is just the beginning of my evaluation of this front office and of this coaching staff because for the last two years that they've been here, the salary cap has kept them in jail. They have been unable to really create the team, in my opinion, that they want to here. And that's nothing against the guys on this current team, but we know this is a team that's pieced together with a ton of guys on their rook- on the early days of their rookie contracts and then a lot of free agents that are signing one-year deals. And, and so – to be able to say that even in all of that and even in the growing pains and even in the losses and and, in everything that we've seen, that there is a foundation there that is reliant on Tyler Algier and Drake London and Troy Anderson and AK and D'Angelo D'Angelo and Kyle Pitts. And I mean, AJ Terrell, Chris Lindstrom, all of those guys I just named all in their rookie deals, right? All of them. So these are pieces that you're going to have for a while and you're going to be able to build around them. And here's, I mean, so I have to give a shout out to Matt Haley and John Dayton, who they write our nerdy birds report, which runs on Friday mornings. And Read it. It's fun. Yeah. We, I, I learn something new every, every day. Cause I sometimes don't get like too stat heavy. I try not to, cause sometimes I do think stats can be misleading. I feel like Dean P's just like, spoke through me at that point. Oh, 100%. Um, But they really did break this down that only 11 players on this active 53-man roster were on the team prior to last year. Wow. 11. On the 53-man active roster, 90% of the players are under 30, and 50% are under the age of 27. That's the fifth highest mark in the NFL in terms of young players, and Atlanta leads the NFL in rostered players under the age of 26 at 13. Wow. That is, and then the Falcons also have the fifth highest percentage of players on rookie contracts with three or fewer years of experience. That's 85% of this 53 man roster. I, I know I just threw out a ton of numbers <laughs> and stats and everything, but that's important when you're looking at this team and where it wants to go. And I do think that there is something that with this foundation that they've laid, that there is something for the future to be built upon. This team has had its issues. This team has had its problems. This rookie class has had their growing pains. But even in saying all of that, they are still showing that they have a foundation worth building upon. Yeah. Every offseason, or at least the off seasons that we've been here, of which there aren't too many. but I've been here for three. Oh, three. Uh, <laughs> but during the offseason, we do this series called building blocks right Ooh. and and it's and you have to select guys who are on their rookie deal who you would consider part of the Falcons young foundation Tori and I did this last year this was before Ashton came on and we had to come up with five or six and five by, and five and by the time we got to the fourth one we're like who are we gonna pick mm-hmm. right and now this off season it it's almost gonna be the opposite yeah there's there's gonna be too, too many, many. We're, we're gonna have to expand the series which I think is a sign. It's a way of saying that I do think the young foundation is expanding. And we all talk about the growth that you see between years one and two when the guy has an off season. Arthur Smith has brought this up a couple times where he says the growth between years three and four, mm-hmm. like what we're seeing with Chris Lindstrom, who was already pretty good and now elite, that, that there's an opportunity there. So when – Throw Caleb McGarry in there, too. Yes, 100%. The, the Caleb McGarry that we are watching play this year is head and shoulders above what he's been since he's gotten to Atlanta. Yeah, and those types of things are encouraging because he's he's not all that old anyway, right? Yeah. So but so you, you're looking across this roster, and it look, 
there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. And, and, it's and gonna, we, this is not an excuse. No. I want to say that too. Just because I'm sitting here being like the, there is potential and hope for the future, that doesn't excuse the fact that the Falcons are out of playoff contention and they've lost as many games as they have this year. This yeah. is not an excuse. True. No, but if – we are in evaluation mode now because there's nothing – because we know when the season's going to end. Yeah. And I, I think that those are some encouraging signs. As you can, as all of a sudden you get the money and then you have some more draft capital and you look at what you have and maybe your needs are lesser or you're, you can draft for depth, you know, the, all, all those types of things I think are encouraging. Um we just hit the 30-minute mark. We generally have a hard out at 30. We try yeah. to anyway. Um, so thank you – so much for yeah. joining us on this episode of Falcons Final Whistle. Please do us a solid rate, review, subscribe to the Falcons Podcast Network. Hopefully, if you're listening to this on your commute or your run, you've reached your final destination. And uh, <laughs> have a pleasant day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a what a way to what end a it. way to go. That's so nice, isn't it? Though, yeah. uh, but you know. I'm Scott for Tori and Ashton. Uh, thank you so much. The season finale of oh. Falcons Final Whistle is next week. Yeah. Yeah, next week good. after the Falcons play the Bucks here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. We will talk to you then. Thanks. See ya. What kind of ending is that? <laughs> <laughs>